Welcome to the last lecture for this week. We have fun and games. Uh, anyways, in this lecture, we're going to talk about conditional probability and independent events. So this is one of the first major topics that involves doing some non-trivial things with probability that directly impacts your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day, you make decisions based off of conditional probabilistic events. Okay, so let's start with some motivation. In the real world, the likelihood of events can depend on other events. For instance, if E1 is the event, you will get hungry at noon, and E2 is the event, you ate at 11.30, then the probability of E1 is dependent on if E2 happens. So this is the basic idea of conditional probability. What is the probability that one event happens given that I have additional information that another previous event already occurred? Okay, so let's look at an example. Suppose I flip two fair coins, so 50-50 odds for heads and tails. What is the probability that I get at least one heads? Well, we've done this problem before, so let's just chase, check out the answer real quick. The possibilities are S is two heads, a heads and a tail, a tails and a heads, or a tails and a tails. I know that the probability of each one of these events is uniformly distributed since the coins are fair and one flip does not affect the subsequent flips. So these are all equally likely from here. Thus, the probability that I get at least one heads is the number of uh, elements of S that have a heads in them divided by the total number of elements in S. So that's three fourths. Note, we can also compute this by using a binomial distribution, right? Flipping a coin is a Bernoulli trial, and I'm flipping two coins, so the probability of that is dictated by a binomial distribution. So I want the probability that I get at least one heads, so I need to compute the probability that one head came up or the probability that two heads came up. And if I do this just via the binomial distribution stuff, I get this for the probability that there's one heads, and this for the probability that there are two heads. And again, if I add this up, I get three over four. So just keep that in mind that sometimes multiple distri probability distributions can be used to solve the same problem. Okay, so let's look at a more complex example. So this was an example where I didn't have any prior information. I just flipped the two coins. Now, suppose I again flip two fair coins. What is the probability that I get at least one heads given that the first flip was a tails. So before, my sample space was all of these options, but now I know that at least one of the flips was a tails. So if I look at my original options, this option here can no longer occur because there's no possible flips that were a tail. Uh, so now my new sample space will simply be the set S that contains these three elements where heads heads was removed because it did not contain a tails. So from here, the probability, again, these are uniformly distributed at this point. So the probability would simply be the number of heads divided by the total uh, option. So there's two ways that I can have a heads pop pops up. So it will now be two thirds. So the fact that I flipped one uh, coin lets me update the likelihood that a certain event will happen, in this case, getting at least one heads. And that's the basic idea of conditional probability. Okay, so these toy little examples kind of indicates that something is going on here. And that kind of begs the question, is there a nice formula for computing these conditional type probability problems? Well, the answer is yes, and let's give an informal derivation for this. So let's informally derive a formula for conditional probability. So here in this case, I'm going to restrict myself to a very particular case, uh, but you don't actually have to do this to derive the formula. It just makes it a little bit less working with various parameters. Uh, so suppose S is equal to the set here. E1 is this event that contains elements E1 all the way up to EL, and E2 contains events EL up to E sub other L. And here I'm assuming that the only element in common between these two things is EL. I explicitly don't need to assume anything about these sets E1 and E2. 
I'm just doing this to make the picture a little bit cleaner. Okay, so there, what would this picture look like? So here I have S, my big set. Here I have E1 that contains elements E1 through EK and this EL over here. And then I have E2 that also contains EL and some stuff over here. And then I potentially have some stuff out here with S. So here formally, I could have more things in the intersection. I could have nothing in the, in the intersection. The math still works out the same. I just did it this way to make it a bit more concrete. Hopefully it'll be a bit easier to follow than working with the completely abstract case. Now, a natural question that might be asked is, what is the probability of E1 given that E2 happened? Well, let's go over to Mr. Paint to examine this. Okay, so if the event E2 happened, then my options for my sample space are now smaller than S, right? I'm guaranteed that E2 happened. Therefore, I'm guaranteed that I'm inside this set here. So now, given that this is my new sample space for this probability problem, what would the probability that E1 happened be? Well, if this was uniformly distributed, it would simply be the size of this green set divided by the size of E. So in that case, the green set would simply be my E1 intersect E2, and the size of E2 would simply be this. So again, this is if I'm in a uniform distribution, but generally speaking, I'm not in a uniform distribution. So how would this generalize to an arbitrary probability distribution? Well, instead of talking about the size of E1, E2, I would want to know what is the probability that E1 and E2 happened. So explicitly, that would be this statement here. That's the probability that I'm lying in here within this big set S. And I want to divide that by my new normalization factor, which would simply be the probability of E2 happening. So this ratio here tells me the probability that I'm lying inside here, given that I'm lying inside here. So this is how to compute the conditional probabilities. So explicitly, the probability here is the probability of this intersection divided by E2 and the probability of E2 given E1, well, I just simply flip their roles and it's gonna be this term here. So I don't necessarily want you to memorize this formula per se, knowing this idea of green divided by the total ways that you can be in the greenish red area, if I draw lines here, yeah. Uh, green divided by red is kind of the more useful idea here. Uh, that said, you can get by just memorizing the formula and plugging in, but... As you know, the important thing is to understand what you're doing rather than to get the right answer. So now, another way of thinking about conditional probability is think how you would play the game Battleship or Guess Who. So if you're not familiar, in Battleship, you have this kind of grid here where you make guesses about where your enemy's ships are, and that's up here on this board, and they tell you whether you hit a ship or you missed a ship. So a priori, before you make any guesses of where their ships are, uh, the shapes of the ships give you a non-uniform distribution for the probability of where the ships are. So for instance, uh, there's certain configurations on the boards where the ships can't go. But either way, you have a probability distribution sitting here of where the ships are, and then you make a guess. Every time you make a guess, you change the probability function for where the ships are. In your assignment, I will give you a question involving Battleship, so you'll be better acquainted with this after you do that uh, assignment problem. Now, next, suppose I'm playing Guess Who. So in Guess Who, your object is to find the person that the other player picked. So in this case, the person we picked was this guy here. And in their case, they picked someone else. So in order to guess who their character was, I pose yes or no questions. So questions that do have a Bernoulli distribution, by the way, uh, about the characteristics of their character. And they say yes or no. And then I can remove those characters from my possibility. So since it's equally likely that they pick any of these given characters, the probability distribution is a uniform distribution over all of these characters. And every time I eliminate characters, say 
if I said the character has a red beard, the only character here that has a red beard is this one here. So I'd mark him down by flicking it down. And then I'm using conditional probability to update the probability distribution function to say the probability of this happening is zero. Therefore, the probability that it's any given one of these other characters changes. I mean, it's still uniformly distributed, but that's the basic idea there. So you have done conditional probability all throughout your life before. If it rains, there's a higher probability of getting struck by lightning than if it's not raining. If you're vaccinated, you have a lower probability of getting sick than if you're not vaccinated. If you study for a test, you have a higher probability of passing than if you don't study. So these are all types of questions that we could quantify and then ask you to compute certain conditional probabilities based off of. Okay, so let's give a formal definition for uh, conditional probability. So this is exactly what I said on the previous slide, just in a theorem format. A and B and S that are non-empty sets the probability of A given B is this thing, and similarly, the probability of B given A is this thing. So explicitly, I need non-empty here. Why do I need non-empty? Well, if it's an empty set, this is zero, division by zero, not good. Okay, so let's look at a few examples of using straight up conditional probability. So first example, what is the probability that the sum of two D6 is equal to seven, given that the first roll was a six? So here, there's kind of two ways I could do this. I could do it without using these formulas here, or I could do it with using these formulas here. So let's do this both ways and then see that they agree with each other. So since the first roll was a six, we now need to roll a one. That's our only option to get a seven, right? Thus, there's a probability of one out of six of rolling a sum of seven, given that the first roll was a six. So for this problem, this is kind of the realistically the fastest way to get the solution. That's not always the case. So let's look at this another way using the new formula we have. If A is the number of ways to get a seven with 2d6, and B is the number of ways that the first roll can be a six, then the probability of getting a B is one over six, assuming a fair die, and the probability of B intersect A is simply going to be one over 36. So why is this true? Well, this statement here is saying the number of ways that I can get a sum of seven with 2d6 and the number of ways that the first row can be a six. And we know there's only one solution to this equation here, right? But why do I have a 36 here instead of a six? Well, this probability here is taken over the sample space of all 2d6 rolls. So I have one possible roll out of 36 rolls. So that's why this probability is a one over 36. So to be explicit, sample space over here is dealing with one die, sample space here is dealing with two die. So you do need to be careful with that in your problems. It can cause incorrect answers. So thus from here, probability of A given B, well, by definition, that's the probability of A intersect B divided by probability of B, or one over 36 divided by six, which simplifies to six over 36, or one six. So the formula works, I do get the same answers. Okay, so from here, I could ask you to do lots of questions like this in your homework or on your midterm, or on your final. And I will be covering quite a few examples of conditional probability in the next lecture. I just wanted to get to independence in this lecture, so I kind of pushed those back. Uh, another thing to note is conditional probability is used extensively in Bayes' theorem, which is realistically one of the most useful and important theorems that's covered in definitely the probability section of this course, but maybe even most of this course. Uh, it has an infinite number of practical applications, which we'll talk about shortly. So do make sure you understand the conditional probability now before we start using it like you would use derivatives in Math 119. Okay, so now we can use this conditional probability to formally introduce the idea of what I mean by independent events. So previously when I talked about the Bernoulli distribution and the binomial distribution, I, I mentioned that the individual trials needed to be independent from each other, where the probability that I got one result in a previous trial doesn't affect the subsequent trials. That's the idea of independence, and let's now formalize this. So we're going to say that two events, A and B and S, are independent 
if the probability of A intersect B is equal to this product. So before we look at some examples, let's introduce a theorem that will actually help us unpack why this really means that A and B are independent from each other. When probability A and probability B are non-zero, the following are equivalent. So probability of A intersect B is this product, is the same thing as saying the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A, which is the same thing that the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. So if one of these are true, you can prove the other two, and yeah. So let's just give a very brief sketch of part of the proof of this. So it's sufficient to show that this statement here holds, so this third one here holds if and only if this first one holds, and that holds if and only if the second one holds. If you do that, you get that equivalence works everywhere here. So let's look at one of these. If the probability of A intersect B is equal to this product, then the probability of A given B by definition is this thing here, right? Just definition of A given B. Uh, and now, since the probability of A intersect B is this, I can replace this A intersect B. And doing that gives me this thing here. And now you can note these two terms here cancel. So this is just the probability of A. So this is showing that if this is true, then this is true. Uh, similarly, you can show if this is true, then that thing is true. And finally, kind of going the back way, showing like if, say, this one's true, then the top one is true. Uh, you basically say if the probability of A is equal to this, well, this thing here can be rewritten like this. And then you can multiply it by the probability of B, and you're done. So from here, I'll leave the rest of this proof as an exercise to you. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to do. The hard work is kind of noting this algebraic uh, statement here to start with. So now my claim is that it's easier to understand independence in a conceptual way from these two statements here. So let's look at this definition and kind of unpack what these mean. Well, since the independence of A and B is equivalent to this statement here, and this statement here, let's interpret the meaning of independence in terms of these functions. So in words, this equality is the same thing as saying the probability that A given B happens is the same thing as the probability of A. So in other words, this is saying that events are independent if neither event affects the likelihood of the other. So the probability that A happens given that B happens is the same thing that A happens. So B, the event B, does not affect the event A. So let's give some examples of independent and non-independent events to kind of make this a bit more concrete. The event of getting a 6 the first time a die rolled and the event of getting a 6 a second time a die rolled are independent. So here, if I roll a die the first time and then roll a die again in the optimal settings, those are independent events. Uh, it could be the case that you roll the die the first time and it gets landed in something that's sticky, and then the second time you roll it, it gets stuck on that face. That would be an example of a non-independent event, but generally speaking, dice rolls are pretty independent. So let's look at a non-example. The event of getting a six the first time a die is rolled, and the event that the sum of the numbers seen on the first and second trials is a seven is not independent. So the probability that I get a seven is different when I first roll a six. So basically what's happening here, if my first dice roll is a six, then I'm limiting the possible options uh, that I could roll on each of the two die to get a seven, so I'm changing the probability. Okay, another example. If two cards are drawn with replacement from a deck of cards, then the event of drawing a red card on the first trial and drawing a red card on the second trial are independent. So I draw a card, get a red card, put it back in, shuffle everything up properly, draw again. Those are That's an example of an independent uh, collection of events. On the other hand, if two cards are drawn without replacement from a deck of cards, the event of drawing a red card first and then drawing a red card on the second trial are not independent. This is because a deck that has a red card removed proportionally will have fewer red cards. So here in this I have kind of a couple of assumptions that are built in. My deck contains different cards, so they're not all red cards. Uh, but mod that example here. 
uh, these would not be independent events. Now let's look at some numerical examples. So suppose a suppose the probability of a is uh, 0.35 and the probability of b is 0.42 and a and b are independent. What is the probability of a union b? So here I'm told that these are independent. So first thing I need to do is write probability of a union b in terms of things I know and potentially the probability of the intersection. So solution from claim 37. So again, I said these claims would come back. Here's one of them. Uh, we know that the probability of the union is equal to this expression here. So I don't know if A and B are mutually exclusive, so I can't say that this is going to be exactly equal to zero. Further, since the events are independent, I know that the probability of A intersect B is simply the probability of A times the probability of B. So if I combine these together, I get the probability of A union B is equal to this thing here, so just copy paste, and this is equal to this thing here where now everything's written in terms of probability of A and probability of B. I know these values, they're these two terms here, so plugging in those numbers gives me this. So previously, I could only really compute the probability of the union of two events if they are mutually exclusive or if I knew what this intersection was. Sometimes computing that intersection can be a pain, but I know if the events are independent, then I can freely uh, substitute this term here in with this product here, and boom, I know the probability. So independent events are nice in this sense. Okay, let's look at another example for showing that things are independent. Suppose the probability of A is equal to 0.5, the probability of B is 0.53, and the probability of A union B is 0.1. Are A and B independent? So solution, we know A and B are independent if and only if the probability of the intersection is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Well, for this problem, I wasn't given the probability of the intersection, so I can't check this just by plugging things in, right? Well, I do know what the probability of the union is. So is there a theorem or a claim that I know of that combines the probability of A, the probability of B, the probability of the union, and the pro probability of the intersection, potentially? Well. Yes, right? Claim 36 tells me for all PDFs, I have that this statement here is true. Thus, if I know that A is independent, then I can use this. Thus, if I know A and B are independent events, I can take this uh, equation here and plug it in for here to arrive at the new statement, this. So again, this only holds assuming A and B are independent. So to be explicit there, I have if A and B are independent, then this, the converse of that statement is not necessarily true. So in this case, let's simplify the statement. Well, this thing is simply equal to this numerically, just plugging in these probabilities in their correct spots. And this is not equal to point 0.1, which was equal to this. Therefore, via a proof by contradiction, we have that A and B are not independent. So formally, if we assume A and B are independent, then this thing here is true. This gives me a contradiction, which contradicts the, my assumption, which was that A and B were independent. So this is a pretty good test that I can use to show that things aren't independent. And we have a theorem here. If A and B are non-mutually exclusive independent events, then this equation here holds. So the key thing to keep in mind here is that if A and B are mutually exclusive, then this intersection is equal to zero. Therefore, the events would be independent if and only if the probability of at least one of the events was zero. So this whole process would then break down because I'd need one of these probabilities to be zero. So yeah, just always use this as the definition of independence and don't try to use this restricted theorem here. Okay, so we will end with one more uh, classic example. So the birthday paradox. If 23 people are in a room, what is the probability that two people share a birthday? So here we're assuming 
that the uh, birthdays of individuals is uniformly distributed. Uh, in fact, that's not actually true. More people tend to be born in the summer, if I remember correctly. Uh, kind of makes sense because winter months you're stuck inside. Uh, anyways, how would I go about trying to compute this probability, assuming that the birthday dates are uniformly distributed? Well, solution. Let B be the statement at least two people have the same birthday. Okay, so B is the statement I want to compute the probability of. So instead of computing the probability of B, I'm going to use complementary counting. Right? If I wanted to compute B, I have to consider the case where two people have the same birthday, three, four, all the way up to 23. I don't feel like adding uh, 22 different things together. So we'll use complementary counting and instead compute this probability here. Now note B complement is the event that no one shares a birthday. So everyone has a unique birthday. And also I should mention here by birthday, I mean the day of the year, not uh, including the year itself. Uh, if you do that, then it, the problem is completely different. Okay, so this whole process can be computed using conditional probability. So what is the probability of B complement? Well, what are the options for the first person's birthday? Well, the first person's birthday can be any day of the year. So it could be all 365 days of the year out of the 365 days of the year. And yeah, so the probability for the first person is just one. Now for the second person, uh, what's the probability that they don't share a birthday with any of the previous people that we've had here? So what's the probability that the second person's birthday is different than the first person's birthday? given that the first person's birthday was insert day of the year. Well, that person would have 364 options for day of the year to pick from out of the 365 options for the days of the year, ignoring leap year and all that jazz. Okay, and again, this is because the first person picked a birthday and given that they picked a day, this person can't pick that day. And now I can continue this process for person three, person four, all the way up to person 23. And that gives me this probability here. So if we multiply all this together, we get that the probability B complement is 0.492. And thus the probability of B is 50.08. And here my percent sign didn't show up, but there is a 50% chance that if you're in a room with 23 people, uh, at least two of those people share a birthday, like a birth uh, day of the year. So this is technically not a paradox in the sense of the Barber's paradox, but it's a paradox in the sense of you would not expect 23 to be the number of people you need in a room to have a 50% chance that the people share a birthday. But the reason why it's such a small number is this conditional probability thing that goes on in the background. Each time, the denominator stays the same, 365 as you go, but as you go further down the list, the numerator has to decrease by one each time. So it starts at 365, then 364, etc. So because of that, the probability of B complement goes up rather quickly with the number of people. So yeah, uh, conditional probability can be weird, uh, and you'll get some nice homework problems to compute some things and I'll give you something to think about. Okay, so assigned reading, I want you to read pages 33 or 83 to 84. So in this assigned reading, they talk about the Monty Hall problem, which I skipped over for now, but I will talk about it in two lectures when I talk about Bayes' theorem. So if you want to get a kind of head start on the Monty Hall problem, you could uh, focus. So if you want to get a head start on the Monty Hall problem, uh, feel free to read that material. And then they give a couple of examples in the definition of uh, independence and conditional probabilities. So yeah, and we have a meme for you. What is conditional probability? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so have a wonderful weekend and I will talk to you later.